Well, this year we've been talking extensively about prayer. We began the year unpacking Matthew chapter 6 and the instruction on prayer that our Lord gave to the disciples, the model that they should use and follow in prayer. Dalton helped us earlier this year from Philippians 1 in seeing what our interceding for each other could and should look like. Our elders are going to unpack that more and more throughout the rest of this year, particularly in the month of July. We'll, we'll be talking a lot about prayer, what it means and looks like to intercede in even more ways, more variety of ways that the Scripture points out, and even addressing issues like adoration in prayer and confession of sin in prayer. So we're going to be talking a lot about prayer throughout this year. This morning, we look into another aspect of prayer that perhaps doesn't receive as much consideration when we talk about the subject of prayer, and that is, with what kind of passions should we pray? I mean by that, what are the heartfelt yearnings that we should have in praying for others? What should we long for? What should we desire What do we want for others? Not so much here in this passage that we're going to look today are we going to talk about what we should say, though that's certainly implied here. We're not just looking at how we should say it and express it, but more what is driving us when we're praying for one another, particularly one another in this room, those who are members of our church, those who are fellow believers in the Lord with whom we share such fellowship week in and week out? What's driving us in prayer? What's motivating us? For what are we actually passionate to see as a result of our praying for one another? So this morning we're going to consider the passions that comprise faithful prayer. In fact, what we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, is not merely the content of Paul's intercessions for the church in Thessalonica, but the very issues that he has already expressed that he's passionate about, what he wants, what he yearns for, and for what he is desperate to see happen among this group of people. Now, we know that Paul prays for this church. We've seen that already in this letter. He prays for this church. You remember back in chapter 1, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. He's always praying for this church. In chapter 2, verse 13, we constantly thank God. That's expression of continual prayer for that congregation. Chapter 3, verse 9, what thanks can we render to God for you? He's still praying for them. Chapter 3, verse 10, we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Paul is always praying for this church. Then in verse 11, we actually get to hear him pray. This is the first time in the book we actually get to hear him pray. And he prays in in a unique way. He's not praying with direct address to God. God, may you do this in them. He prays in the second person, God, may you do this. And he says it to to them directly, to you. May God do this to you. It's kind of like when you would say, may the Lord bless you. You're saying that to someone. That's a certain kind of prayer that you're offering up. May the Lord bless you. You're praying it to the Lord, but you're speaking it directly to the people. That's what he does here. We get to listen in on his prayer. Now, we've already examined the passions of a faithful pastor in the first five verses. We looked last week at the passions of a faithful flock in verses 6 through 10, and now we dig into the passions that we should express within prayer. And I would say, consequently, as we look at these passions, they are also passions that are stoked through prayer. The more that you have these kinds of passions or you pursue them, you develop them, you cultivate them, the more you pray according, the more you're going to see these kinds of passions grow within you. Now, what are they? Well, our passage dips into the exemplary prayer life of the Apostle Paul and shows us really that faithful prayer is passionate about a present ministry in people's lives that will yield an eternal confirmation 
through people's faith. So what kind of desires are expressed within this kind of biblically faithful prayer? Well, let's unpack two passions because there's two requests in this text. Two passions within biblically faithful prayer. And I'm going to suggest to you that the two requests that Paul makes are reflective of what he longs for, what he is passionate about in this church. I mean, think about what you long for and what you're passionate about when you pray for people. You're praying for others. What do you long for? What do you want the most? And as you think about that, I want you to think about, does, do, do my passions reflect what we see in the heart of the apostle in his prayer for this church, which we know he loves so dearly? So two passions within biblically faithful prayer for others. First of all, we've talked about this a bit, but he says it again, and we need to hear it again. This is a passion for personal investment in others. This kind of point, this beginning is really a struggle for all the introverts in the room. It is. Me being one or supposedly one, like, ah, oh, personal investment. Yes, I, I want that too, just on my terms. But this is what he's passionate about. Personal investment in others. Verse 11 now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Now you remember he said in verse 10, he is desperate to see their face. And so on the heels of that he says, so I am begging God to see you. For him to direct our way to you. I mean, how many times has Paul in this letter said to this church, I can't stand it any longer. I want to see you. I want to be in your presence. In chapter 2, verse 18, we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan, Satan hindered us. What kind of expression is that? I am dying to get there to see you. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says that. I could endure it no longer, so I sent Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 5, when I could endure, endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. I have to know how you're doing. So I'm sending a part of myself, Timothy, to you. Chapter 3, verse 6, six I, you are longing to see us just as we are longing to see you. He says it again, and then as in verse 10 that we've alluded to, night and day we're praying excessively that we may see your face. How much does he want to see them? He longs for it. So he prays for it. He prays for it. What he wants is what he prays for. Which is very instructive to us about prayer. It's not always how prayer is felt perhaps or expressed we, we know that we need to pray for people, and we may even have biblical insight into what it is that we're to pray for them, or what we should want for them, but do we really, really want these things for these people? Are we passionate about it? I mean, Paul has said it in every way possible. I am so passionate for these people. And that's why I'm praying for that. Do you actually feel that way for the other members of the church to which you have committed yourself in a covenant kind of relationship? Do we really want these things for these people? Are we passionate about the people we are praying for, experiencing what the scripture calls us to pray for them? But even more, are we passionate about having a personal investment in them? I mean, it's one thing to say, yes, I'm going to be passionate to see these things in the people. Are you passionate about yourself being used by God to invest in the people of this fellowship? Because that's what Paul's expressing here, of how desperate he wants to be with them, and he's praying 
within that desperation. So uh, let's unpack that a little bit about how Paul expresses this passion to invest in others. I want you to notice that he appeals to the full involvement of God to bring them together. Did you see that? He is praying for the full involvement of God to make this happen. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord. He could have just said it very simply, may God direct our way to you. He did not say that. And I don't think, based on studying Paul for a while, Paul just throws words in there to fill space. Do you? I don't think so. This has to be something intentional and specific. May our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Clearly, he's praying to God the Father. Jesus taught us to pray to the Father, our Father who is in heaven. But he also prays and makes appeal to the Son, Jesus. And I think likely, this is just me maybe reading between the lines a little bit, We could quibble over this later, and you might be able to pin me down and say I'm wrong, and let's talk about it later. Not now, but later. Let me tell you my my thoughts on this first. Likely, we could see the implication of the Spirit in that phrase, direct our way to you, because this is God personally involved in the circumstances of Paul's life and the circumstances of the lives of the Thessalonians as well to cause it all to happen, which theologically I think we could say is the active work of the Spirit among his people and the circumstances of life, moving in concert with the will of the Father at the direction of the sovereign Lord. So if the Trinity is invoked here, I would think that whatever he's praying for is highly significant. Now, it might not seem so significant to you at first that he's just saying, hey, I would like to see you. You say that to people all the time. You get off the phone with your relatives on Mother's Day, Father's Day, or some other holiday, and you say, oh, I wish we could see one another. But you don't normally say, I'm invoking the Trinity so we could see each other. (laughs) Well, that's what he's saying here, isn't it? I'm praying for the full involvement of everything that God is, that he would help us see one another. And it's right at the beginning of the prayer, right at the beginning. This is a little like us and how we pray and how we're taught to pray, to pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. When do we normally put in Jesus' name in our prayer? At the end. And that's not wrong. I don't want to suggest it's wrong. But that's normally where we're praying. We're kind of summing up everything that we prayed for and we say, everything we prayed for, we're asking for as if it would represent the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, which is good. But Paul starts at the beginning by invoking God. This is an idea that Brian Chappell brought out in a book that he wrote about prayer called Praying Backwards, where he suggested that the attitude in which we express our prayers and even the content that we're asking begin with the word that we typically end our prayers with in Jesus' name. Does the attitude from which you start your prayer, does it begin with this should represent God or does it just end that way? What radically shapes how you pray, doesn't it? Chapel says, as strange as it may seem, if we would dare to pray backwards, we would remember to start where we end, in the desires of our heart, if not in the actual words of our mouth. We would discover the foundation of blessing on which all answered prayer is built. He goes on to say, we seek to offer no prayer to him that we could not pray backwards. In putting Jesus' name first, we move our designs to to the rear and place his in the front of our affections. Such commitment springs from the faith that when we pray in Jesus' name, he will give us the desires of our heart because our heart's greatest joy will be for his will to be done. So before Paul says, I want to see you, he prays this invoking God as if this would be God's will. He's confident this is what God would want. Would you be so confident to appeal to God in this way for the things that you want most? Just as a note here, 
he recognizes that Jesus and the Father are God. The text, actually in the Greek text, begins with himself, singular, and the verb direct is singular, not plural, as if he were appealing to two different people, but to one God, the Father and the Lord Jesus. He's invoking God. Now, furthermore, I want you to see something else here. Paul appeals to the full operation of the Trinity to act because he knows that for him to actually see the Thessalonians, it's going to require the activity of God. It's going to require the activity of God for him to get there. I think sometimes we don't think that dependently on the Lord either. Sometimes we we make our plans. You got your plans for the summer? I have some of my plans for the summer. Do you write them in pencil or do you write them in concrete? I would suggest pencil with someone above owning the eraser, right? I've set some of those plans, but do I really think it's going to require God for us to make this happen? I, I think he's praying here because he knows I can't pull this off. And, and he's already expressed some of the challenge. Now, I don't think that what he's praying for here is some general direction from God. Oh, God, just kind of generally give our way support and help us to get there. That's not really what he's praying. Because do you remember what he's already said about his attempts to get to them? Who was hindering him from getting to the Thessalonians? Back in chapter 2, verse 18, it was Satan. And the devil was the very one who was the one tempting them to wander away from the faith. So the apostle Paul knows for him to get to the Thessalonians, it's a spiritual course he has to run. There's going to be some challenge and that challenge is, the scene behind that challenge is really spiritual. So he's appealing to God and he even appeals to Jesus as Lord which expresses his sovereignty the Lord Jesus who expresses all sovereign rule over everything that's going on may that sovereign Lord direct our way to you may God his father who is all wise and knows what is best who cannot be stopped who created all things with the breath of his mouth, may he be the one who leads us to you. Do you see how dependent he is on God? Just to see them, to be with them. Do you ever expect in your prayers that you're asking for things that only God can answer? Do you ever think that way? Is that what you're praying about? Only things that God can answer. It's going to require the Trinity to act for this to happen. That's how he sees this. But I want you to see something even further. For what Paul requests, he trusts the providence of God to make it happen. He says, I'm praying that the Lord will direct our way to you. What is our way? Well, it's our circumstances in life. It's the normality of our life. All the details that go in the normal flow of our life, may he cause all of those details to direct us and guide us to you. Now think about that. Just think through how many people were involved in your way getting to this place today. Well, there's a lot of people who are involved because you drove here and there's other people on the road. And you took for granted that none of them hit you this morning. None of them stood in your way. You have family members. And, and as you, we all know, if you have family members who are trying to come to church, it's like fine spiritual warfare every Sunday just to get here, isn't it? Why, why is everybody such a bad mood on Sundays? Why is it so hard on Sundays? I wonder. But he's talking about our way, just the normal circumstances of our life, how our life goes. God must direct all of those circumstances. He must lead and guide those circumstances so they end up bringing him back to them. He's praying for God's providence, isn't he? Because God's governing all things to his glory in the details of our life. 
So does that mean that Paul is just passive in his attempt to get back to them? Is he just kind of let go, let God, hey, if God wants us back, we'll get back there? It just doesn't seem to be from studying the life of Paul that he's, he's Mr. Passive. Not if he's wanting to get back there so much. I'm, I'm guessing he's planning. He's thinking of every way to get there. He's evaluating the circumstances. He's looking at steps he could take to respond to what's going on around him in the present. Praying that God, would you use this to get me back there? Trusting that God will direct all of those things to bring them back together. Now let me play that out for you just a little bit. Let me play that out for you. Paul is passionate to get back to them as quickly and as soon as he can. You hear that in how he's written this letter. Did it work out that way? Did it happen? Do you know? Well, if we go back to the book of Acts and we just examine what happened in the historical setting, it's really instructive knowing how desperate Paul wanted to get back to them. Well, how did it work out? Did God direct his way back to them? Well, he did. He did. But I want you to think through how it happened. If you went back into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17 is when he comes to Thessalonica. Acts 17 also says that he was run out of Thessalonica, down south into Berea. Jews from Thessalonica heard he was preaching in Berea, so they marched down there, run him out of that city, and he goes down to Athens, even further south. And in Athens... He's preaching there on Mars Hill to the leaders and authorities and the philosophers of the day. A few people believe, most do not, no church that we know of is established. So he leaves Athens and goes even further south into the region of Achaia and the capital city of Achaia, Corinth. Acts chapter 18 records him going to Corinth. And he spends a considerable amount of time in the opening days of his ministry in Corinth from what we learn because he's waiting for Timothy and he's waiting for Silas to come. And they were in the northern parts of the Grecian peninsula and they had to make their way down, which would have been likely months before they actually got there. And the beginning of Acts 18 says that it actually happens. So he's probably there for months. Then in Acts 18, 9, it says, the Lord said to Paul in the night, By a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. What does that mean? Paul, you're not done here. There's more ministry here. A church has been started, but I want you to stay. And so verse 11 in Acts 18 says, he settled there in Corinth for a year and six months. This is after he's already been there for a few months. He settles in for a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And then... In Acts 18, verse 18, even after that, it says, having remained many days longer, he took leave of the brethren and put out to the sea for Syria, and they came to Ephesus, not Thessalonica, Ephesus. Now, if you looked at a map, Thessalonica in the northeastern part of the Grecian peninsula, Ephesus is on the western coast of what is modern-day Turkey. That's not in the right direction if you want to get to Thessalonica. He's going away from Thessalonica, but he goes to Ephesus, Acts 19. Marvelous ministry in Ephesus. Disciples of John the Baptist who never knew there was a Holy Spirit converted. They received the Spirit. They show the signs of the Spirit. A church is established. Incredible ministry as people given to sorcery are throwing their books into the fire and they're repenting and a marvelous church is established. At the end of Acts 19, after all that ministry in Ephesus, it says in verse 21, now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem's not towards Thessalonica. It's even further. But he wanted to go to Jerusalem. But only after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, meaning he wanted to go back north into Macedonia, which is where Thessalonica is and Philippi and then he also wanted to see Rome so having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him Timothy and Erastus he himself stayed in Asia for a while but he wanted to get back there perhaps the Lord let him go back but it was years years before he could get back now, when I'm reading 1 Thessalonians, I'm not thinking he's, 
He's wanting it to take years to get back. Are you? I want to get back there now. You're new believers. I want to minister to you. And I'm praying for God to direct our way to you. And you might say, well, God said no. Well, why would God want, why wouldn't he want him to go to Thessalonica? For these young believers, they need the Apostle Paul. They're all alone. There's such opposition. Why would he not say yes? Well, how many other things in your life do you wonder that about? Why did God do this? Why? I'm praying for it. I think this reflects the will of God. I'm appealing to God because I think this is his heart. And he says, not now. Five years down the road, maybe? Ten years down the road? Anybody in here been praying for two decades or more for something? That you know this would reflect the heart of God. This is his appeal within the providence of God. Nonetheless, what he prays for is what he's passionate about and he's trusting God for. That is, I want personal investment with you. One letter is good. It gets a second letter out too, 2 Thessalonians. It's short. Two letters are good. But the letters don't ease the passion of his heart. He wants to be with them personally. It's a similar thought to the Apostle John. You remember the Apostle John and those little letters at the end of his books, 2 John and 3 John? We, we throw them out, pass over them so quickly, but, but think of how much personal ministry should be a part of Christian ministry. John says in 2 John 12, though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. Your joy being completed needs our personal ministry. Third John, verse 13, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Paul's a writer. We know that. He writes almost half the New Testament, but he's not satisfied with writing. Paul didn't say, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of a, a to myself kind of guy. I just like to write things out. I'll send them to you and be satisfied with writing. It's not how he talks. As D.A. Carson noted about Paul in this passage, here is a Christian so committed to the well-being of other Christians, especially new Christians, that he is simply burning up inside to be with them, to help them, to nurture them, to feed them, to stabilize them, to establish an adequate foundation for them. He never descends to the level of mere professional. Paul is a passionate man, deeply immersed in the lives of real people. This is not someone intoxicated with ideas, but unconcerned about people. Nor is it someone who is content to minister at a distance through books he has written, perhaps, or through younger emissaries. No, this man's ministry is not designed first and foremost to produce ideas, books, or junior colleagues, but to serve the people of God. And to this he is passionately committed and that passion shapes the prayers he utters on their behalf. And I might add, what he wants so passionately for them, they want to from him. They want him there too. I think we need to be aware of personal temptations for a lack of personal ministry. We need to be aware of our own personal temptations to avoid a more personal investment of ministry for a more distant one. We need to examine the excuses we use for keeping ourselves to ourselves. We need to put those excuses on the witness stand in front of God's word. We need him to be the judge and either put those excuses to death or at least incarcerate them or fine them severely to put them in check. And, and listen carefully. I understand how we talk about being an introvert or an extrovert, and we use those categories to talk about the normal, natural penchant of our personality. 
but at the end of the day, those are not biblical categories for seeing self and ministry. Those might be challenges, but they're not categories that God says, ah, I get it. You're an introvert, you write. You're an extrovert, you visit. It doesn't say that. It's not how the Bible talks about ministry. And you can say, well, it hasn't gone well for me in personal ministry. Again, bring the excuses before the judgment seat of God. How well did it go for Paul? It was a challenge. It created challenges. It wasn't always easy. I just wonder how how desperate we are to be personal with people. I, I get it again. Listen, I understand it. We can't be intimately personal with 400 people. We can be personal. We don't have to be impersonal or shy away. But I I would encourage you, if you struggle with this, pray more. Pray more. It's fascinating to see what the Lord does in your heart when you pray significantly for an issue that you struggle with personally. Pray for that. And beyond the prayer, do what Paul is likely doing here, strategizing for ways in which he can get to people. Watch the passion begin to grow. And don't expect that the situations are going to be easy or they're going to be immediately intimate because that's not how life works. Significant relationships take significant time and some of that significant time is spent over the mundane and less exciting things of life. That's part of it. It's part of how you grow close to people. But pray for it. Grow in those passions. That is a passion within prayer is for personal investment in others. That leads us to a second passion within biblically faithful prayer that we want to look at. It's found in the last two verses of this chapter, verses 12 and 13. It is a passion for increased love for others. A passion for increased love for others. Not only is he praying for the Lord to bring him to them, but verse 12, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. That's the second request. But it's also the second passion of his heart. What he prays for here is what he has already exemplified for them. I mean, go back and read sometime chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, and you ask yourself, does Paul love these people? Look how he invested himself in them. Look what he gave up for them. He loves them. So when he says, I'm praying for your love to increase, they already know what that looks like. They've seen it in him. They've experienced it from him. And it's what he's actually going to call them to do more of in chapter 4. He's going to call them to love people through purity in the first part of chapter 4. He's going to call people to love, he's going to call them to love people expansively in verse 9. So he's praying for what he's about to tell them to do. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love. And notice again, he appeals to the sovereign Lord Jesus, the Lord to cause this to happen, to cause them to grow in love. In other words, the Lord has to do this if it happens. That makes me pause for a moment to think about, so, so what is his view here about love? This, this love that he's talking about is not, not just a natural compulsion for some person. It's a spiritual quality that requires divine activity for it to be present and even for it to grow This requires the Lord. I'm praying for the Lord to cause your love to grow. So this is not just natural affection. This is spiritual love. And this love that requires the Lord's direct involvement is not a personality trait that comes easier for some, but not for others. It's a spiritual quality that no one has outside of Christ. No one naturally has what he's praying for because it requires the Lord to cause it to grow. This is not natural love. It's supernatural love. It's the kind that is, as Sam was praying through, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's as Romans 5.5 refers to it, the love of God that has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
So understand this, Christian, understand this. Your love for others, if it's a biblical love, is not natural to you. And understand this, if you're not a Christian and you say, but I have love for other people, we're not talking about that kind of love. This is a love that goes beyond that, that's different, that's deeper, that, that requires the presence of God for it to be real and effective. It's the kind that John referred to in 1 John 4, 9, 4 19. We love because what? He first loved us. You want to know what love we're talking about? The kind that God showed. The sacrificial, God-centered, spiritual. But notice carefully the terms that Paul uses here. He assumes that they already have it. They're Christians. And he's already told them back in chapter 1, verse 3, that he's, he's very grateful to God for their labor of love. So they have it. But he wants it to increase and abound. Increase speaks of a a quality that is already present growing deeper. He wants it to grow deeper. He wants it to grow higher. Let it increase. And he wants it to be expanding, abound. It's the idea behind the word abound, broadening, expanding, abounding in the quality of love that you possess through the Spirit. He's praying that their love will deepen and broaden and that the Lord would cause it to deepen and to broaden. And what he's praying for, we know he's passionate about. He's praying for them to apply what he's about to teach them to do and what they have seen him do with them. So what kind of love for others is he praying will increase? Let's unpack this just a little bit for just a moment. What kind of love needs to increase? Well, first, it's an increased love for everyone. It's an increased love for everyone. As soon as I hear that, my mind runs back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, you know, it's easy to love those who love you. The Gentiles do that. So we're not talking about that kind of love. This is for everyone. Well, what do we mean by everyone? Well, he says, may the Lord cause you to to increase and abound in love for one another. Who's that referring to? Believers. Other Christians. May your love increase and abound for other Christians. For one another. And no doubt that they have been expressing this kind of tangible love to each other in the body as they've been going through all kinds of suffering As a church, they've been meeting needs, they've been coming alongside, giving comfort, helping one another. I know that they have expressed that because in chapter 4 he says, as to the love of the brethren, you don't have to have anybody teach you, you are doing that, I just want you to excel still more, remember that? So we, we know they have that kind of love. But can I just say here that loving the brethren is the front line of demonstrating that you have true faith in Jesus. Don't pass over that too quickly. Loving other Christians is the front line, the leading line in displaying that you are actually possessing true faith as a Christian. Galatians 6.10 While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially those who are of the household of faith. Especially those who belong to God, who are his children, who are your brothers and sisters. With whom you are heirs of God's eternal inheritance. The Apostle John is so instructive about this reality and this need to love each other, other believers. Jot down in your notes 1 John 4. In 1 John 4, verse 7 through 11, just listen to these words. Just jot it down. You can go back and meditate on it later, but listen to them. Listen to them carefully about what they're saying about loving each other. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
By this is the love of by this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. How did God show us love? Sent the son so that we would live through the son. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another, the brethren. In verse 20 of 1 John 4, if someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother. What does John say about him? Well, this person says, I love God, but he hates his brother. Liar. That's what the text says. He is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. You have to love. So the way to know how to apply that is to find the people in the church directory that you have the most trouble loving. It really is. I mean, that is the challenge. Find the people that you think, oh, I love them, but I, I, uh, I'll pray for them. <laughs> uh, not, not, that's not the next invitation over for, for lunch. It's not necessarily the folks we're going out to coffee week with next week. They kind of, kind of great a little bit. You say, oh, well, we don't have any people like that here at Summit Woods. Praise God. Isn't that good? We don't have anybody who's irritating here. Why did you laugh about that? No, it's, it's for us to think through. One of Israel's, the, the chief sin in, the, in Israel in the Old Testament was not merely their idolatry. Their idolatry showed up, but what sent them out of the promised land was their lack of compassion for their own people. The most needy people among them were not being cared for, and because of that lack of compassion. And and why was that such a big deal? Because Israel was to show the world what God was like, and if they can't care for their own people who belong to God, what are they saying about their thoughts about God? And they're the people who represent him. So judgment came, not just to wipe out the idolatry, but to remind them, you must love my people. But this is not just calling for a deepening love for other believers. It's also calling for an expansion of love for non-believers too. Do you see that? For all people. For one another and for all. That's literally, the Greek just says for all. For everyone. For all. Not merely just believers. But for anyone You say, well, how do you know it's referring to non-Christians? Well, again, if I look at the instruction that he gives in chapter 4 when he talks about love, in verse 9, he says, now as to the love of the brethren, verse 10, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But in verse 11, he says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, work with your own hands, just as we commanded you, so that you you will behave properly toward whom? Outsiders, non-Christians. So what he's praying for, love for everyone, he's going to call them to do in chapter 4. In fact, Jesus said, loving each other, loving all people is the basic way we demonstrate that we actually love God first. You remember in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And the lawyer answered him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and, all, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and this is really fascinating, he did not say to Jesus, how do I love God more? He said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? He assumes that he loves God supremely, but he knows he doesn't love others equally. And what is the next thing Jesus does in answer to him? He tells the parable of the good Samaritan. 
Why does he give the parable of the Good Samaritan? The Samaritan who most people thought can't be of God. A Samaritan can never know God. And who obviously knows God at the end of the parable of the Good Samaritan? <laughs> not, not the Jewish leaders, not the rabbi, not the priest, not the Levite, not, not those guys, but a Samaritan who most people thought can't love God. And he loves someone who's not like him, who would make him unclean, ritually unclean. He goes and takes care of them in the most abundant and extensive way. And Jesus says, do you have the answer to your question answered? Who's your neighbor? Meaning, if you can't love your neighbor, which means everyone, including the unbelieving world, can you really love God? So he's praying. Paul is back in our text for you to grow, you to increase, abound in love for each other and for all people, just as we also do for you. So in case they needed an illustration, Paul came to them when they didn't have the gospel and he loved them. He lived with them. He served them. He worked among them. He met with them day and night over and over, week after week, not just when they believed, but before they believed. He was a perfect example of this to them. He loved them. So they knew what that looked like. So he wants them to increase in their love for everyone. But I want you to see a second kind of passion for increased love that's expressed in verse 13. Not just for everyone, but he wants an increased love for eternity. For eternity. Now I want you to look at the first two words of verse 13 very carefully. I'm praying for you to increase and abound in love for one another and all people so that. Or you could put there in order that. In order that he may establish your hearts without blame. That is astounding. That is astounding for us. Loving others is the granite that causes your heart not to waver from the Lord. Your heart is the control center of your entire being. It is how you think, how you feel. It is how you make decisions in life, how you act. That's the heart. And he is praying that you'll love everyone so that God may establish your heart, your inner person, your inner person, to strengthen it, to establish it, to cause it to be so strong that there's no accusation that could be made. So it's blameless. So think, think about this. Is your heart weak in its faith? Have you ever thought through this? If your heart is weak, if it's faltering, if it's waning, if it's uneven, have you stopped to examine not how much you love God? How are you loving others? Loving others so that you might be strengthened in your heart. Do you see that? Again, go back to the, the lawyer's question. How do I know I'm going to have eternal life? Love God and your neighbor. Well, I think I already do the love God part. Well, how about the neighbor? That's where Jesus goes with it. So what is it that causes your heart to be stable and unmoved? The love of the brethren. Could it be? Could it be? That when your heart is more susceptible to being flaky and discouraged and weighed down with guilt and anxiety and thoughts about quitting. It is when you are less likely thinking about others and more about yourself. That's when I notice it in my heart. I am less stable when I am preoccupied with me even when I'm serving others I've given out I've given out I've given out and what do I get in return I've just turned the table 
As soon as I say, what am I getting? I'm preoccupied with me. I'm not serving. I'm not pouring out. I'm not investing. And I start to get unstable. Is this the way it's always going to be? Well, maybe I don't love the Lord enough because I'm not feeling it. That's where it goes, right? When you're fixed on loving others, when you're fixed on serving them in a God-centered way, it's amazing the thrill, the joy, the blessing that begins to strengthen your heart and establish you. Preoccupation with self causes weak hearts. Zealous love for others causes strong hearts. But, listen, Paul is not praying here that you would just be strong and stable. Look carefully at what he says. He wants your love to increase now so that he may establish or strengthen your heart without blame. Blameless, one word in the Greek New Testament, blameless. That is, no accusation of guilt will stick. That is a lofty goal, isn't it? I want you to love each other so well that there's no accusation of blame in all of your loving of everyone. Now, are you like me and you say, impossible? It's impossible. I can have really good weeks. I can have a whole good season of life. Then all of a sudden, crash. Or I'm loving others, think it's going well, and I'm neglecting this whole group that I hadn't been paying attention to. I'm like, well, you forgot this group over here. So how do you do this without blame? Well, that's the standard. That's the standard. That's the goal. It's the goal without blame. I know it's not the present reality, but it is the goal. We're to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew 5 says. Well, that, that sounds impossible. Oh, but wait, friends, there's more. It would be one thing to just love without blame if the standard of blame was each other in the church because we, we would go easy on each other. We'd say, oh, yeah, I, I know you've, you've had a, but man, you, you're really good. You're one of the greatest lovers in our church. You love so many. I know you might have some fault, but you're, you're the model of it. No, that isn't the standard, though. The goal is blamelessness, but what is the standard? Blameless in what? Holiness. Now, what is holiness? It's whatever defines the nature of God. Not us, not our standard, not what we think it should be. Holiness. Holiness is what God is. It's whatever distinguishes him from everything else that's common. And it's the kind of life that reflects his uniqueness. That's what holiness is. So to be without blame in your heart as a result of your love for others is determined by whether your love for others was exercised out of complete, undiluted devotion to God alone. A love that causes your heart to be strong without blame according to God's perfect standard on his own character. That seems impossible. Oh, but wait, there's more. There's more. Who, who is going to be the evaluator? Not the church, not your family. Who's going to evaluate it? Do you see it? In holiness, before whom? God, the Father. Before our God and Father. Now, I want you to be mindful of what's being said here. This is not a statement about the Father's current Awareness. This is a statement. This is an indication of the Father's final evaluation. I'm praying that your love now will abound and increase so that you will be strong in blamelessness that looks like holiness in the Father's final evaluation of your life. Well, when is that going to happen? He tells you. At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is a beautiful thought. The coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The coming is the word parousia, which we're going to become more acquainted with in the months to come. Parousia is a term to describe 
the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you examine the use of that word throughout, especially the Thessalonian letters, you're going to find in in the Thessalonian letters, it's almost always referring to the second coming of Christ. And there are a number of different events that are associated with the parousia. It's alluded to in chapter 1, verse 10, in connection with him coming in wrath. It's referred to specifically in chapter 2, verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians, when Paul's joy are all the believers finished and completed in the presence of Jesus at the parousia. It's also mentioned in chapter 4, verse 15, when the believers are caught up into the air with resurrected believers to be with the Lord in the air at the coming of the Lord, the parousia of the Lord is the catching away of the Lord. So the wrath of God is present at the parousia, the catching away of believers is present at the parousia. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 even distinguishes our gathering to him as a specific element within the parousia. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 refers to another element of his coming, of his parousia. It's the appearance of his coming. And when the appearance of his coming comes, he slays the lawless one and he brings in his kingdom. But here it refers to an event, the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now, some debate, does this mean with all of his angels or all of the Christians. Well, all the major English versions translate this as saints, not angels. In fact, when the Apostle Paul uses this word saints, uses this word holy ones, every time that Paul uses it, it refers to saints, not angels. Now, yes, there are aspects and elements of the Lord's return, events connected to the Lord's return that have angels connected to them, but here he's referring to the coming in connection with all the saints. And yet this coming with all the saints is some kind of presentation of the saints before God the Father. Remember, he's praying their love increases without blame, in holiness, in the presence of the Father at the time connected to the parousia. So there's some presentation of the believers before the Father, and they are complete without blame in holiness. Likely it's after that kind of presentation before the Father that the saints come with Jesus to the earth, slay the lawless one, complete his judgment, and establish the kingdom on earth. That's how it seems to flow in the Thessalonian letters particularly. So you take all that together and you notice what Paul is praying for. Perfecting love for all the saints. The kind of love that sanctifies you to the place of complete stability so that no blame can ever be assigned to you according to God's own nature, evaluated in the presence of the Father himself at a period during all that is connected to Jesus' return. Have you ever thought about your love being that serious? Have you ever thought about your love right now of other people being that? Have you ever thought about your love being that connected to eternal security? It's phenomenal. He's praying for an increased love for everyone, but also for eternity. Current love for others will be the evidence for your eternal affirmation by the Father during the return of Jesus. How important is our love? I I see why Paul's so passionate about it. He sees how important it is. Especially if if these people are his hope, his joy, his crown of exaltation at the coming of Jesus, he wants them to be perfected. It's an incredible thought. The kind of passions you find within faithful prayer for others is a passion for a personal ministry with others. It is a passion for their love to increase among them and others for all eternity. What what is it that hinders you from having those kinds of desires for one another and for others? Personal ministry and a kind of passion that wants the love of each other to grow and increase. 
Maybe you need to cultivate those more in prayer. Maybe, maybe you could do something. So in the coming months, we don't have a Sunday evening gathering throughout the summer months. And growth groups kind of meet in spurts. Some, some meet this week and that week, but they don't meet as regularly, it seems. Could you use your Sundays more effectively to cultivate the love of other believers in the church? And could you look at your directory and say, who does that need to start with? How could we do that? How could, I, how could I engage in that more faithfully? And what do you think the result would be? You think it would create more disgruntled feelings? Of course not. You think, wow, that, I, think, I think that could be good. Well, use your summer not just for self, Use it to cultivate the love of God for each other and personal ministry with each other. I hope that you'll know the joy of those kinds of passions for people more specifically, consistently, and deeper so that we're all rejoicing in the face of the Father when he comes. and We see him, see Christ in all of his splendor. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray for your spirit to convict us where we need this and to challenge us also in ways that we need to be challenged personally and corporately as a congregation. I pray that in this moment we would not just think about ourselves, though, that we would fix our mind on our Savior. He's the perfect example, He is the model. There's no greater love that we've ever seen than what Jesus has expressed for those whom he bought on the cross. He gave himself for them so that they would be changed. And he has committed himself in constant, compelling love for all eternity. So help us to look to Christ. Father, in the moment where we're preparing our heart to take of the Lord's table, remind us that we've seen perfect love. We've seen ultimate friendship. We have been exposed to the epitome of what human affection should actually look like and feel like when we look and we see and we read about and we study the person of Jesus. And now in these elements we're about to take, we are about to say that we are the representatives of Jesus on this earth. And we know how much we fail, but we know that you did not die in vain, Lord Jesus. You gave your life. You were raised from the dead so that we have complete hope that we will be completed. So we openly identify ourselves with you in this ongoing way through the Lord's table because we have confidence that you'll bring us home to the end. We think about what you expended on the cross for us and our hearts are gripped with such an example of love. Lord, I pray for those who are here who don't know you as Savior, who are, have not yet bowed themselves before you and your Lordship that you would again show them there's no greater love and there's no one who is ever going to make any eternal difference in their life other than you and that they will one day come face to face with you either as savior or as judge and I pray that you would turn their hearts to you to love you with all their heart and that would be expressed in breaking down the pride that keeps them from loving others and they would embrace you and love you supremely. Lord, thank you for this opportunity when we can express who we are because of what you have done. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. And ask the men to come who are going to distribute the cup and the bread and want to remind you, if you're a member of our church, you're... you're welcome to partake. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in the Lord's table, but the Lord's table is for those who have publicly identified themselves.